It's Wednesday. I'm at home. Stop. Before we get going, please subscribe to our channel. It's free. It's easy. Just click and click the notify bell and find out when we're putting more videos out. We're about to give you so much knowledge, knowledge gained over 15 hard years in construction, property and business. This is Every Trade Behind the Build, episode 18. So we're at my house and in my bar, Alex and I, quite early, we're having a little beer, but we think it might loosen us up a little bit and you might get better answers. So Hollywood is gonna ask the questions from behind the camera and Alex and I are just gonna answer. Nothing's planned. We've had a quick look at the questions. There's a variety, but we don't really know what's coming. So Hollywood, question one, please. Question one, how did every trade start? So. It started about 15 years ago. It's a bit of a mad story, really. I was um, in a different career. I went to uni and I actually did television uh, broadcasting and I worked at ITV for a bit and I thought I wanted to do that for the rest of my career. Then one day I got a bit of a random phone call out the blue, sent me out the blue, saying I was going to be a dad. Now, I was with the girl, and um, it was, um, but it wasn't planned. And it happened and I thought, wow, I was like 25 and I was like, right, I need to do some here because I was on like four weekly contracts. So literally at the end of four weeks, they'd just either let, let you go or give you another four week contract. So I had no real job security. So I was driving in tra and I was in traffic with my uncle at the time, uh, who, who was still my uncle, but at the time I was driving <laughs> and he, um, he was an electrician and the recession had just sort of finishing. It was like 08, 09. And um, he had no work, so I was helping him find bits of work, helping my dad, who is the general builder, find bits of work. And I said, why don't we set up a handyman company? And essentially, we just did it. And he backed me and said, yeah, I'll do it. He had skills. I had no skills, but I knew how to sort of do a bit of marketing. I knew how to write well. And the idea was that I'd find the work and he'd do it. And it went from there. And it just literally grew from there. And uh, yeah, to what, 15 years later, we've got... 40 odd guys. Tell them about the story when you were in the wholesalers that time. Which one? When the van was outside. Oh yeah, yeah. So the original name of the company, well the actual property of the company is TDG Contracts Limited. That's the legal limited company. And But TDG comes from the handyman company called the Domestic Genius, <laughs> which I don't know why I came up with that. It was, the idea was that it was kind of like the handyman service aimed at housewives. This sort of, it was, a, it was like a guy with like Einstein hair and he could do everything. And it, when the first van was signed up, uh, I'll put a picture on now of it. The first van was signed up like that and I was dead proud of it personally. And I was in Selco, the bills merchants, and I was walking down the aisle and I heard these guys going, seeing that van out there, <laughs> the domestic genius, and they were all like pissing themselves. <laughs> And I was like, oh God, I knew then I had to change the name because I thought I can't be ridiculed for the rest of my life. And also we started winning work in like um, schools and things like that, more like corporate stuff and that just wasn't the right brand. And I, it soon grew from being a handyman service to a proper building company. And then we started doing extensions, new builds, loft conversions. Um, so pretty much straight away we rebranded. Uh, but that's what TDG stands for. The heavy trade bit comes from when social media started really kicking in and playing a big part in the company. And I knew that TDG Contracts wasn't the right name for that. So the, the, the brand, the, the sort of slogan was always every trade, one company, every trade. So I'd stuck with the every trade bit. Mm. And that's basically what we're known as and everyone knows as to this day. Um, and uh, we've sort of spun it off. We've done a franchise with it and all sorts of stuff. And it's the every kind of thing we've learned. It's, to other businesses that we've yeah. got, and and the idea, what the right the idea is that construction is basically just one part of our whole suite of businesses, which we'll probably talk about later. So yeah, that's how we got started. Question two: When you guys started out, how many did you have? Well, again, Alex and I have both got different start out stories. Really, I mean, it might be worth talking about Alex how he got started. How in many property. do we have? What do you mean there? So how many tradesmen do we have? Ah, property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I started out, I was a tra electrician by trade, weren't I? So, um, I started out doing HMOs and property on my own, and I was getting local trades in to help me out, and friends of mine who were in the trade, and working on the HMO myself. You did a lot of just you and your dad, didn't you? Yeah, uh, the second one I did, I stopped sparking on site and was full time on job. 
um, fitting out and doing everything from every aspect of it, ripping out, putting steels in, boarding, um, done nearly everything apart from plumbing bits and plastering. Um, so in terms of a team, when I started progressing, that's when the likes of Christian, who's still with us now, I brought him in, um, and then my relationship with Christian grew, and I got a couple of other people who are still with us now to this day. So the team's only small because I did a lot of it myself um, compared to what it is now. So back then, yeah, probably like two or three when we first started out. So for me, for every trade, when that started, it was just me and my uncle. And um, I remember we were getting small jobs in. It was literally putting up shelves, changing door handles. I knew nothing, um, but I could do a little bit. I remember I had a proper budget tool set. It was embarrassing. Probably still got it, to be fair. And um, we'd go out. What, that you could use? Yeah, I'm pretty good, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, built, I put this on the wall. <laughs> I didn't really. Um, so we, but the idea was that my uncle, I would do the work, I'd find it, but then because we just got big quick, I ended up stepping in. But then what happened was, you just sort of used the people you know and trust. And I didn't have that many contacts in the industry. In fact, I had none. So my dad was a bit of a general builder, painter, and he was doing his own stuff with another one of my uncles. And then they came in and they did a bit. And then slowly but surely, we added uh, tradesmen, um, I had it really early, I did Tom, our heating engineer, it's been with us for 15 years. And it was a bit of a bold thing. We were getting, it was like a really cold winter and we were getting loads of like heating inquiries randomly from a letting agent. So I took on, I just put an advert out for a heating engineer and got Tom and just gambled that I was getting busy. Yeah, you're fine as well. When you take people on, yeah. they come to you, there's one thing and then they become something else yeah. um, that they grow into. They go yeah. into a role that's not even there. Yeah, we did. Well, for, that's it. So uh, what we found, the best people for us to recruit, probably both sides mm -hmm. of the business is multi-skilled tradesmen. So what I really like is someone to have a main trade and then have maybe secondary and third trades. Someone who's not scared to get involved in a bit of everything as well. Yeah, but skill set's one thing, but attitude... Uh, and loyalty uh, uh, loyalty more, yeah. yeah things like that there and reliability, reliability yeah. <laughs> yeah they're like the, the major things because you yeah. can have the best tradesman in the world who doesn't turn up yeah. or you can have someone that turns up every day and just can't can't knock a nail in mm. so it's hard really and we, you know we could I'd do it rather pick reliability than yeah control. attitude i i have this mm -hmm. saying it's like attitude over aptitude mm -hmm. so i um i could i mean we could that would be a separate video about how we recruit maybe we'll do let us know if you want to see any sort of separate videos on any of these items because i know there's a lot of we've got a lot of our audience are tradesmen builders but property people and it's there's, there's so much sort of synergy between the two subjects but yeah a uh, very small team and it just went from there to the point where at our busiest which is sort of just after covid we had 60 lads working for us mm -hmm. But now with all the other like other businesses like preferred joinery and uh, probably got more than that. Yeah, it's probably yeah, it's probably got the same more. again across the businesses. But yeah. yeah. Starts more. Question three. I have been a builder for fifteen years. Where do I start in property? It's weird having an American guy reading all the questions, isn't it? No, it sounds yeah. special. It depends where you want to start, doesn't it? What your what your strategy is if you're busy as a builder full time and you haven't got time to put into property, then you either need to partner up with someone who knows property or wants to get into property, and they're going to be the person doing the day-to-day -day stuff and you just assist with the building side of things. Because you've still got to find a property, find a deal, raise the finance. Or you get involved with people who are already doing property and you, you do some sort of investment, and like it's sort of like you'll invest, but go and see their jobs as they progress and learn, so you can pick up skills. Um, and way to do things, or you become like an equity partner, depending on what your investment is. But it's hard, isn't it? Really, depending on your position. Yeah, I, I would just. Um, yeah, it is hard. It's, it's, yeah. Not without knowing the full truth, in and out of what that person is doing now. Mm. If you've got time on the side to be able to put it into property, because it does take time to get it off the ground, then start looking locally where you are finding an investment area that you wanna you wanna invest into. Pick an asset class. In terms of if you wanted to do buy to let to a family or if you want to get into HMOs, professional students, if you want to do flips. I'd say stay in a lane as well. I'd say pick a strategy. Like Alex's strategy was HMO. Yeah. Like now we've got range of strategies, but still our main strategy is HMO. It's what we know inside out, particularly Alex. Yeah. Um, but I, I was... Because like, if you're a builder, like you speak all, so if you're a builder and you want to get into property, you don't want to be doing flips because you're only going to make a 20% margin. Yeah. You're going to take on all that risk. You've got to buy the property with your own money. Put yeah, deposit you might down, build an extension. Do all other bits mm. and bobs. When you're, you're just go and build an ex extension for Joe Blogs around the corner. Have no risk. 
in terms of what you've got to put in terms of your money you get paid every couple of weeks um, whereas you do a flip to earn 20%, 25% you know, you could be waiting 12 months before you earn that profit. So it's like... But I'm a massive believer in builders and tradesmen should have a property strategy yeah. to run alongside your main. I think we've got the perfect setup in that we've got an operational business that makes us week to week cash flow money. Um, and then we've got the property strategy, which will basically make us money long term. You can have property as a business on its own, but uh, it just to scale takes, it. It's, yeah, it's, it's to scale property, it takes, it's like a burning candle, it takes forever. Mm. Um, but if you're looking for cash flow, instant cash flow to replace your income as a builder and don't want to be a builder anymore, or just want to build out for yourself doing property, then HMO is the way forward because you can get that cash flow yeah. quick. And um, as builders, don't forget, like we're we're making other people money. We're adding value to their houses. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, if we're working if you're working for property developers or investors, you 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 know you are making them money. So I do believe that we are an integral part of that process as builders and tradesmen, so we should have a piece of the action. Um, but you can get distracted. Prior to knowing Alex, I started doing some buy-to-lets myself, and I'd find that like I'd end up spending all my time putting all my resources and my guys and tying up loads of cash in these little buy-to-lets, which really only made me a few hundred quid mm-hmm. a month. But what I will say, owning them has been sort of one of the best things in the world because it's got me out of situations where we've managed to sell one to raise some money or I've refinanced another one to mm-hmm. raise some money. So you've always got that. It's like property. It's it's bo- just- it's a boring asset class, but it's so safe. It's so reliable. Mm-hmm. And, it's, it, and it's one that essentially uh, is supply and demand. Yeah, and one thing people always try in time, right, is getting into property. So yeah. they always think, oh, there's a crash coming. I'm going to mm-hmm. start buying now because the prices are going to come down. I wouldn't even pay attention to that. If you've got money sitting there ready to go or you've got time on your side that you want to put into it, just get involved because as long as you can buy at the right price, it doesn't really matter what mm. time of year it is or mm. what year it is when you buy because if, you, if you're if you prepared to stay in there for like 10 plus years, you've got time on your mm. side. So mm. time in the market rather than trying to time getting in is more important because mm. uh, as Chris said, you know, you can play with the capital, capital once uh, you need it. Question four. Of all the trades you cover, which one gives you the most pleasure? None. <laughs> trades, well, yeah. Pleasure. You know, it's funny, I quite, I, I'm weird. I like seeing the floor coverings go down because it's kind of, you're at the end of the job. And I think once, it's one of the most undervalued trades, but once something's painted and the floor goes yeah, down. I'd say, yeah, I'd be, I was going to say painting, yeah. I'd yeah. say painting only because... You know you're under the job, don't you? And we can closer to refinance. You refine, can just see yeah. it coming in, yeah. yeah. I mean, all of the trades are good. I mean, I like plastering, even though I don't like the mess. I like the fact that once you're at a plastering stage, you, you know, you've hit a good milestone in the job and mm. you can start seeing what it's going to look like in terms of a layout. But I, I actually painting. really, my favourite bit is the heavy construction side. I love, like, messing with steels, bigger stuff like anything mm. like I like I like and I also like machinery so I like the dig out stage groundworks I really enjoy groundwork so I, I love all all, all building I, I probably yeah. like second fix least final fix and that's probably why Alex and I are a good partnership because he's he's more into that he's stronger he'll enjoy his finishing stuff it's not a snag man traders isn't it yeah yeah so yeah pay, probably to fall towards the finishing side is better well, I'm more the beginning so yeah. happy days I like because I, I just as well think as well Speaking with my business head on, a lot of money is at the beginning. A lot of money is in the ground. A lot of money is at the heavy stuff, and, and you not lo- you lose loads of money on the end. Yeah, and not a lot of people. A lot of people think they can do the end bit, the painting, the floor coverings, that. Whereas the actual heavy sort of construction side, mm. yeah, I don't really like the bit in the middle. I don't like M and E. That bores me a bit. You see, you're like, so you're electrician, so yeah, yeah, I don't mind but, it. So yeah. it's decent. It's bit too hard for me. That bit too clever for me. That it's the good bit. Yeah, I love it all. To be fair, anything that makes us money. Next question. If you had to start from scratch, what would be your first steps? I could get a reply to both property. So, and, sure, you go, yeah. you go in property. Probably something similar to what I've done. I'd look at, I'd assess where you sit in your life currently. Mm. What money you've got behind you. If you're in a job or not, if you want to replace that income. Um, who you have got around you. And then I'd, if I was to start again from scratch now, probably do the same. I'd probably get back into, do HMOs again. Um, I'd, do very something similar, but I'll probably hit it a bit more aggressively and have a bit more confidence than I did at the start, where I was only, at the t- when I first started, I only wanted to do one a year for five mm. years. Think how much those and I was still And I was still going to work. I was still yeah. I still wanted to be a spark. I still wanted to go to site. And then it, until I got to like 
number two, number three, it was like, I want to switch now into, into just doing this properly, but I'd probably hit it harder. If I knew what I knew now, I'd hit it a lot harder. I'd go out, raise investment from earlier on, where I was doing it all with my own savings, credit card and stuff like that. Um, and I'd put a proper business plan together, go to someone who I knew had a bit of money and say, do you want to get behind me? And I did it with a bit more pace early on because now, now knowing what I know, Liverpool, where we invest in Liverpool, most of it's Article 4 now, so it's a m- lot more difficult back then. It was the gravy train then. Well, you see the people you know that I mean? bought a lot of property when you first got in now, yeah. some of them have retired. And the prices back yeah. then compared to now. Because it always know. goes up every year. Yeah. yeah every yeah. year. You know, we were, we were buying houses. When I first started working with Alex, Alex was buying houses for 80 grand a house. And we've recently paid two hundred grand for the, essentially the same, same house. Same property, yeah. yeah. Same area. And, but we're still not bothered because we still think it's gonna that three that that be worth three hundred and you know four hundred. So, yeah, so, so I was it, 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 it again. I hit mm. it with a bit more pace, a bit mm. more confidence, mm. and I'd go and raise funds as early as I mm. could and back myself. From the construction side and at that really, I would basically I, there was times where I went too big too quickly, and I tried to overstretch us because the work was there once you build a good brand and you get a bit of a reputation the work comes in quite easily actually it doesn't matter what's happening in the economy especially with what we do because we cover a full range of trades there's so many mistakes i made people i work with that i wouldn't money i spent um i'd sort of take i i think one of my strengths is that i i can make a quick decision and quite sort of act on instinct which is good in business but at the same time i can be a bit um, gung ho, a bit irrational, and make you know, but I make decisions that have been the wrong decisions down the line. So it, it's basically, I think I just, uh, what would I do different? I wouldn't do anything different because it's given me an amazing life and I've um, worked with some brilliant people. But there's definitely certain people and, uh, that I wouldn't have worked with. Um, there's things I wouldn't have bought, and I wouldn't. I just would let it be a bit more organic. Next question: The hardest thing I'm finding is a good tradesman. Do you have any tips? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're, 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 yeah, we're still learning, to be honest. Um, What's the saying here about the frogs? Uh, well, this is what I always say. So you've got to uh, kiss uh, a lot of frogs to find your princes. Yeah. doesn't mean I kiss tradesmen, although I have kissed a couple and they've done a good job. But I'd say what happened, it's like a revolving door. So you can put an advert out on Indeed or whatever, saying uh, experienced joiner, and you'll get... 50 applicants. Yeah, they'll get ground workers applying to the same. All sorts. Yeah. And you'll get people in and you'll chat to them and you'll think, you know what, they seem sound, you know, they dressed smartly, they can put a sentence together. Or the they, CV looks brilliant, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly. Which, But as everyone probably knows, a CV in this game means nothing because um, it's not an academic um, business. So the proof is in the pudding. You get them on site and you try them, you start them on a trial mm-hmm. period uh, and you manage their expectations. Say, look, let, I have a phrase that I always use, don't we, in interviews. We where like I say, you, you like us. Yeah, I always say that. I say, let's see if we like you and you like us. Mm-hmm. And it, it gives you that little bit of like um, introductory period where you get to know people. Mm-hmm. Um, but really now, like, it, so what I, we've got to a point now where we've got our core team and that was really hard getting that core team. But now I poach people. So if I know someone's working for someone else and that are good, I'll speak to them, I'll sound them out and I'll basically sell them the dream. I mean, to be honest with you, I wouldn't say we are recruiting anymore. Like if someone amazing comes along now, I'd get them and I'd find work for them. I'd take a punt. But I actually think that our team is as big as it needs mm. to be at the moment. Um, yeah. And, you know, now we're at a point where we're trying to buy, find really good subcontractors uh, and, you know, and build that network up. But you just, there's no two ways about it. You've got to meet them first, face to face. And a little thing I always do, and I, I speak to Alex about this when we interview, I'm not really interested whether if they can, what they're like, skill set. I'll get that out of the way, but then I'll say things like, oh, like so, you know, family, yeah. I'll find out about the family life. Mm. I'll say, like, have you got any hobbies? You know, have you got any kids? You know, um, and I want, to, I want to know what the morals are like. I want to know what the values are like. Mm. And I want to get to know them as people to work out if I can work with them on a human level. And you get a bit of a picture. And it's hard because you want guys that are sort of fit, physically fit and fast and able, which means they're generally younger. But at the same time, the younger guys aren't the most stable, uh, stable and uh, you know, like reliable. So then the older boys are better. So mm. if, to be honest with you, if I had my way, all my guys would be the older, married or whatever. Do you know, more mm. set, settled in their lives um, because they're generally more dependable. But the downside of that is they can be a bit slower and time is money in this game, unfortunately. Mm. But we're at a very fortunate position now, 15 years on where we kind of can pick our customers and we don't necessarily want to compete on price. We want people to use us because they know they're going to get a really reliable service. We do what we say we're going to do and by and large, the job's right. But yeah, it's hard. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find your princes. But when you do find them, you've got to keep hold of them. That's it.
Next question. How did you two start working together? <laughs> yeah, it's a bad, it's a, Alex laughs because I mean that. It's funny though, isn't it? Yeah. So basically, um, as I explained earlier, I was doing, I was a spark on site, started doing property. Got to a point where I'd stopped working on site and I was doing property full time. And I was getting deals in quicker than what I could build them. So I was thinking I need to get a builder on side now to start looking after the building side of things so I could focus on finding the deals, buying them in and raising the investment that we needed to keep progressing. So I was looking around at the town to find, find a builder who'd done HMOs. A um, few people said they did, but then I seen on social media, I think on Facebook, Chris was posting about one that he just finished in Liverpool on Rodney Street for another big student provider. So, and at the time, I used to look at their photos on Right Move and think their houses were like one of the best in the city, um, which at the time, they were really, really good. So I was thinking, I need to get in touch with Chris. So I was messing you in, I trying to do it. And I was like, I, we'd, I'd, I'd been working in Liverpool for nearly two years and we were obviously away from Manchester. And it was hard work because I couldn't really build a good team there yeah. so I was shipping my lads over and Alex was on me all the time so I was like so I was like so I, even before that we were trying to get a price together yeah. and because I'd done them all start to finish myself I knew the ins and outs of what things cost and then when, when Chris is doing he's like need to manage your expectations it's going to cost you more but you're not putting your time into it so we sat down agreed numbers went for it done two HMOs didn't me yeah it was an absolute nightmare because um, Alex is one of the hardest people in the world to, to work for which is good now but it was bad as being his customer so being his contractor but what it was well, I couldn't necessarily get a strong enough team and it is a, there's a lesson in this about working outside your core city in your core area and basically we just couldn't perform to what Alex had Alex has got very high expectations for for himself and for his art stuff and his at the time his projects. So it was like it was forever like I was going down and meeting Alex. We had a site meeting every Wednesday and it'd be like driving down, just dreading it, thinking, <laughs> just gonna get my head chewed off here about what and it was. But as so that it comes to it, it progressed into like I was just then basically project managing the job anyway with Chris. I was just when we just phone each other every day about it. And then we got speaking then, didn't we? Saying, yeah. why don't we start doing, doing something together? Yeah. And we set out to buy a property to do, to then sell to a fund, which we did. But then we bought it literally like two days before lockdown, COVID, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So we got it, built it out to their specification, what they wanted. It was ready to sell it to them. They stopped buying because of COVID, basically shut the book. So then we were like, what shall we do? And then we just filled it with tenants, refinanced it, kept it, and we've still got it today. Yeah, it's been a really good earner for us, even, just, even though Alex don't, Alex don't like the house, but it's still yeah, I don't like help. the house because it's not done to our spec, and every yeah. year the maintenance is a nightmare for us because we did things... some, Someone else's spec, because our spec's like, we, we, our houses are future-proof, they're we're built to last, because we're not going to sell yeah. them. Maintenance free, like it's easier yeah. to manage, yeah. but this one's a little bit more difficult, but we've refinanced it again since, pulled even more money out and bought other stuff for it, so... Yeah, and, then, and then essentially, essentially then we did a deal where... Alex bought half of every trade. It was during like lockdown. I was working from home, and it was a mad time to do the deal, really. But I was just like thinking, I was getting to a point in my like sort of my journey where I was like, I'm doing pretty well here. I'm earning decent money. But you seen to me, I was stagnated, weren't you? Completely stagnated because like I didn't have a boss. At, like so, I'd like some days I'd come in like a bit later, or but then I'd work really late at night. I didn't have any kind of structure. I had no one to answer to, mm. and it, you know, it was a good life, but. It wasn't necessarily like good for mental health. So I just sort of like I got on really well with Alex, and it, like he had the whole property side, and he's not many people you meet in your career where you think, you know what, I could work with these, uh, you know, I could work with him for for, for a long time. So I, they, they sort of Alex sort of touched on the idea of doing a deal, and I was like, mm, not really, because it just basically it took me a long time. So I bought my dad and my uncle out, you know, which I probably should have said before, and I was, you know, it took me a long time to get control of the company. So. Um, and then it, we just sort of one day I thought, you know what, no, it'd be good because I could see I might have a smaller piece of the pie, but the pie will be bigger. Mm. And I just thought, you know, it's something there and we can then build the whole property side, the synergy in owning construction company and, and property. And me and Alex got a very different set of skills. So we just mm. did it. And then, yeah, it was really interesting because neither of us, he'd never bought a company and I'd never sold a company. So we were kind of like, mm. everyone was saying, oh, you should get lawyers and all that. But at the time, you couldn't get hold of anyone because it was COVID. So we just had... Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, met in person and yeah. just did the deal. And it's um, it's been great like ever since because yeah. it was funny, but well, we went for a point where it was like, it was great, we did the deal, we're all buzzing. And it took ages to get a deal over the line. But yeah. then basically in construction, everything sort of went tits up in that. Yeah. All building materials went through the roof and it was like, oh, but it was weird because people remember, it was at a time when all like, um, 
labour would um, la would be at what more money because there's so much work out there. So mm -hmm. I had to give everyone price, right? So we went from making profit to looking like a loss making company, like mm -hmm. literally as soon as they uh, Alex so had bought to, it. So we had to work hard behind the scenes, like didn't we? Yeah, well, it was good though. It was a real good time to learn, but it's, mm -hmm. I'd say it's taken us, you know, a good couple of years to get to a point where we're back on a yeah, good it, footing. It forced us to look into this everything. everything. Like, like down to the, yeah. it, it's actually a really good exercise. It's stressful. But it was a really good exercise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, it took its toll on me because because I went from feeling like if I made a mistake, it's down to me to feel responsible to Alex, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. It drives you, but it adds that whole layer of pressure onto because it's not just your money anymore. Mm -hmm. So but what, what it adds now, though, so when we do have a problem mm -hmm. in business mm -hmm. on either side of any of the companies, we just bounce off each other. Now, so like mm -hmm. normally, you'd have to I'd be dealing with it myself, thinking I'm gonna fix this, mm -hmm. or what can we do here? But mm -hmm. no one to speak to. No one to like speak the true honest thoughts mm. about what's gonna go up happen. Whereas now we just phone Ring, what can you, we do. Or, or message like literally any time of night we say, right, we've got this problem here now, we're gonna yeah. deal with this and we just sort it. And it is it's funny enough, I was thinking this the other day because I was talking about like finances over like um bank holidays and things like that. And it was like I'd have to deal with all that on my own. Even though I've got a good team below me, it was me. Whereas I was like I spoke to Alex about it and we just worked out a bit of a plan, we're gonna move a bit of money about and it mm. was like it's so good having someone else there just to like yeah, put you, yeah, off, yeah, take the pressure off. Next question. Next question. How much money do you need to start a construction business? Um, nothing, really. £13 and yeah, yeah. company's house? Yeah, exactly. Just literally register the company. <laughs> um, obviously, if you've got a skill set already, then great, you know, if you've got a set of tools, brilliant. So I am not a tradesman, so I had nothing. I had to find people and in a way, I, I blagged it for a long time. Some say I'm still blagging it. Um, I blagged it for a long time because like, I, I had to bring value to the table. My value was momentum and energy and bringing it. But really, you, you can literally, if you've got a reputation or even if you've not, there's someone out there that needs a builder. Mm. Someone out there that'll go for the cheapest price, which unfortunately, sometimes yeah. that's where you've got to do it. But you've just got to get started and build it. And the way we've chose to do it is as we've gone along, I've, I've bought plant, I've bought vans. Didn't have to do that, you know. I sometimes dream about the day of having just like five tradesmen working for me. Yeah. Um, sometimes yeah. you think you make more money. Yeah. Small is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That's what I tell my but wife. But it depends though, of if you're already a tradesman and you're looking to start a company. <laughs> you're laughing there. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> If you're already a tradesman and you want to start a company, it's even easier really to do it because you've already got that background, you've already got you know, a few people who know what you do, family and stuff, and you can just share what you're doing to them and then it'll just slowly grow. But there's never been a better time because of social media. Mm -hmm. You've got oh, that, yeah, like, you've, got, now, you've got a, a window to the world. If it wasn't for social media, and particularly Instagram, actually. Because it's free, isn't no, it? No, it wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now. Like, it's, it's given me everything. Like, we're so lucky to be alive and in business, I, I, or even in your career at this point. Yeah. And now the YouTube thing's a whole new thing for us. And that's actually already opened up avenues. Uh, and who knows what it'll open up next. But uh, bottom line, right? Be passionate, be honest, be reliable, do a good job, go again. Be honest, be reliable, be passionate, mm. do a good job. That's all you can give. You know, mm. turn up when you say you're going to turn up. Do a good job. It's a, it's Don't be scared thing. to lose money. We've lost money because we've done jobs. We, we would have been cheaper for us to. We had a job, and we, we said when we, when we first started working, we lost seventy grand on it. Mm. Now we could have literally said to that walked customer, off job. "What's our job? Sorry, we've underpriced it." I know this happened, but we didn't. It would have been cheaper for us to give the customer sixty nine grand and say, "Go and use another builder." We'd be a grand up, <laughs> but we didn't because our reputation's everything. So. Bad, isn't it? You know, and um, and you know, and but yeah. just touch on the Instagram thing there. Instagram's free to use, mm. but you should treat it like a shop front. That's mm. your shop to sell to people. Mm. So like, even if you're just doing, if you're a joiner doing doors or something, keep taking photos, put them up there, and send it to people because that is your shop. Yeah. It's a free shop to use. Yeah, and the thing is with Instagram as well. I mean, I've done quite well at it, and and you just got to be consistent in social media. Mm. Keep posting, tell your story. That's what people always say. Like, how do you build your Instagram up? It took me ages, and yeah, I've boosted posts. I've done all that. But you just got to just tell a story. I'll do a post about what went wrong. Do a post about what went right. I'll do a post about this is a finished job. Do a post about plans for the future. Mm. People buy from people. Next question. What are the pros and cons of using cars in versus subbies? <laughs> so I think I should probably clarify this. And this is a whole different thing. Cards in, for people that don't know, is on the payroll, essentially. Employed, yeah. Yeah, employed. 
and sub easy subcontractors so you know self-employed self-employed exactly something a like massive that. massive topic we've mm. discussed this so many mm. times haven't we there's so many pros and cons it's probably a standalone video on its own yeah so but probably uh, let's just touch on the headlines because it's it. massive and like it's hard isn't it like so, so if you're in property you you want people who are subcontracted mm. in a way but you still need people who are employed to pick up the pieces and do the in-between jobs because mm. most subcontractors they're in there for a the price and their main aim is to get in there, get it done and get out in their time frame that they've got to allow for it. You have someone who's employed, their time doesn't matter because it's on your time. So they'll turn up Monday to Friday and it'll probably take twice as long if you haven't got the right people in place or the right systems. Mm. So like, that's one thing, isn't it? But I, yeah, Quality. But, yeah. Probably differs again depending on the subcontractor you use. Mm. Um, so, 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 so my opinion from a construction point of view because it's slightly different the property side as well but is that with subcontractors you're getting peace of mind in terms of fixed price and you're also getting less commitment so if you lost all your work you could shed your lads no problem whereas if they're on mm -hmm. payroll it, it, often there's a consequence a financial consequence to that however with on the payroll, you're getting reliability, which is so key. You can't offer a good service and build a great reputation if people don't turn up. And the thing is with subbies, often, if someone offers them money, more money or money faster, they'll go. Sure. And we're actually lucky because we built a reliable network of subcontractors that we've worked with for years. So they tend to prioritize us, but it took a long time to get to that point. There is a middle option. And again, I think this is a separate video, which we'll do. But the middle option is kind of the way we operate, the way a lot of industry operates now is you treat people like they're on the payroll, but engage them via subcontract mm -hmm. on what's called the CIS scheme, which most people will know. So what we choose to do, and I know there's going to be people going about IR35 and things like that, and there is, you know, so trust me. Your contract, yeah, it? exactly. But essentially, the way, loosely speaking, the way we engage them is they work for us Monday to Friday. Whilst they're working for us, they get use of our vans and they feel like they um, have got a job. Mm -hmm. And we treat them like they are employees, so we don't just drop them at a drop yeah. of a hat. You know, we don't, um, if we haven't got any work on, which is rare, but if we're quiet, we'll still find them work, which is expensive, but it's not as expensive as having them cards in where they need holiday pay, um, paternity mm -hmm. pay, um, sick pay, uh, et cetera, et cetera, redundancy if we get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So it is the way of the industry, and I know it's not, everyone's not a fan of it. And in my eyes, I'd love to have everyone. From point of view, though, they'll pay less tax <clears> and they can, they can do it seems own, them. They can they manipulate their own tax as well in terms yeah. of what they want to put in for yeah. expenses. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you should, obviously you got to pay the right amount of tax. Yeah. But no, but I mean, it, it works for them. Like, they'll get a tax rebate every April, and that's like their holiday pay. So they're smart. And my, our guys like it. And I think that it is the way of the industry. I think for me personally, I'd employ everyone because then I, I believe that you work for, so like family, and, you, you, mm. you, and they are your product on the shelf. But it's just not the way of the world. And it's yeah. not the way, no, it's, it's not the way of this industry, you know. Mm. And um, it costs a lot more as well. So if you have mm. someone who's employed, mm. As a company, you have to pay a lot more on asset insurance to contribute towards them, whereas you can pay self-employed people more money because mm -hmm. an employee person, you've got to contribute to their holidays, which mm -hmm. is for 20 odd days for you, plus the bank holidays. National insurance contribution. Yeah. yeah, so like, you know, with it costs, even though an employee might think they're on less money, the actual employer is paying a lot more for them people, uh, mm -hmm. whereas when it's self-employed, you can pass on them more expenses to them. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's, let's, do, let's do a separate video for that. Yeah, let's but, do a separate video for so, that. So, be, as it stands, subbies in terms of work at all, there's loads, isn't he? I'm interested to find out what people in the comments, you know, let us know how you prefer it. You know, we could do a full on standalone video then, list that. Maybe we could do hundreds of videos and stuff for these questions, yeah. Do you want to put a tripod in? No. Nah. You sure? You good? You must have some guns on you, kid. Bro, I, I, I film weddings, so I. I, I yeah, you have got a, you've got a good rack on you as well, lad. Good. Right. <laughs> Next question. What's your pet hates as business owners? Oh, man, I've got a million pet hates. Got just a few. Just, so, had, just had one today. What's that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So we had a guy that basically has just left us without giving us any notice. We paid for training, invested in them. And this is the downside to the self-employed model. Paid for training, paid for... Helped him out at times when they didn't have... 
Uh, You've done things personally as well, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, like supporting him yeah. personally when he's had tough times. I mean, I, I say to Alex before, like, I'm desensitised from it now. It used to really affect me, but it's just business now. Yeah, and I kind of expect basically it. Basically, he's the van off with the keys, no explanation, no nothing. And yeah. it's where hearing through other people who work for us what the reasons are behind it. And it's mm. nothing even spoken to Chris about it. Yeah. That's and what gets you mm. more than anything. Yeah, it does. It, it, does, it is a pet hate, and, but you've almost, I've almost come like desensitised to it now and mm. it, there's n and, and that makes me more so want to I mean he, I would have said this person is someone that I would have really looked after because they are loyal they've been really loyal to me to, the, to this point mm. and I know it's, it's just gone for more money basically um, so it makes me want to look after people that have been loyal to me but at the same time you, you can't really it's sad you just don't know what's going mm. on in people's lives you can, yeah so there's nothing you can do for me I've got a few pet hates really I've got a pet hate with customers when people call their, or it's is tradesmen, but mostly customers. You know when customers call their um, ceilings roofs? Yeah. You know what I mean? No, when other pet hate is bad. When customers ask for a quotation or on work, you yeah. put all that time and effort, yeah. go there, mm -hmm. speak to mm -hmm. them, build a rapport. That's a great point. Put the time into placing it and they could spend days doing back. it. Send it on an email, don't even have a response. Not one, not even a thank you. Yeah. Or not, we got one yesterday, someone rejected us on our system. You can just click accept or decline. And it declined, even though I think there was any context. We were saying, the estimated Danny that we've got was like, you know what, though? I like that because. Yeah, you'd it, rather have that. Yeah, because yeah. you knew. Because you know I mean? they, they don't, what customers don't understand is we put in hours of our time, like, you know, and, and our time isn't just worth. 15, 20 pounds an hour, it's probably worth 100 pounds an hour because we are business owners, right? And, um, and the, doc the documents are actually valuable because they can take that then and go like, this is what I need to do in my house. A lot do. I've um, had builders message me and say, I got sent your uh, estimate the other day and we've been sent other builders' estimates and it's naughty. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of it. But um, yeah, it, it, that is a pay. I mean, I've got a few. I mean, I could, uh, yeah. I mean, I love the industry generally, but it's a lot of weird sort of bits and, and bit mess. Don't like mess. And I hate wastage. I hate like yeah. buying materials and just throwing them aside and buying too much. I mean, you know, I hate things like that, that like grinds my gears massively. Well, Trap tra paying trades and to drive around, pick materials, yeah. and get yeah, delivered from the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, you think that you go. Oh, the tradesman will say, "I'll go and get. Uh, I'll go nip to. I need this. I'll go nip to uh, screw fix and get it." And I'm like, "Yeah, but if if you known you needed it." We might as well get delivered the day yeah. before because it cost. It's either free delivery if it's over fifty quid or it's fi a fiver. But you, as a skilled tradesman, maybe earning 20, 25 pounds an hour or whatever, mm. driving to the wholesale, probably wasting two hours a day, that's 40 pounds we're paying for delivery plus fuel. In the van. Fuel, and, yeah. and, then, and then it's that, but it's also lost time on site. Yeah. So if you think about it, you're losing 40 pounds twice. So yeah, I mean, I could, I love the industry. I don't like, I'm not a neg negative person. You get to a point where you just think, you know what, you just got to accept those things. But yeah, by the way, anyone, the thing inside a room is a ceiling, not a roof, okay? <laughs> Next. Next question. Who's the best roofing joiner out there? Ah, no, I know who sent this question in. It's my mate Ryan from Ideal uh, Construction. He's got a YouTube page. He's got more subscribers than us. Um, he's a good lad. He's uh, good, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's good. He's roofs. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a good lad. He's one of them. He's like, if I had 50 of someone like him, I reckon I'd be a billionaire. No, why he's good, though, because he's on the ground, isn't he? he is. Well, this is, I've had this conversation yeah. with Ryan there. If I had, he, he's quite sensible in that. He doesn't want to get too big because he's on his, he's on the ground and all his jobs. He knows what's happening. All his jobs. He's there hammering the guys. Go, go, go. This yeah. is what he needs to do. Whereas our model's different. We've got twin. Well, sometimes we're up to twenty sites. You know, up to sixty men all across the sites. Mm. We can't be there. We've got project management. We can't be on all those jobs. Yeah, it's like so with the properties, isn't it? Yeah, you so can't right. be in like sick. We got seven. How many? You're, 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 on? you're relying on the people around you to be as a look mm. after things in your best interest. Mm. So it's difficult. But yeah, Ryan is a is a good good lad. And if you're not subscribed, subscribe to his uh, his page Idle now. Construction, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. Stephen Alex knows who he is as well. Yeah, he's a he's a, he's an ex army as well. So yeah, a good lad. Come work for us, Ryan. <laughs> we can't afford him. Any advice on flipping houses? If so, what mortgage is required? It's up to you, this lad. It's not a mortgage, it's a bridging loan, really. Um, you don't want to jump onto a mortgage because you're not really doing it properly in terms of finance. If you're going to buy a house to flip, you buy it with a, bridge, a bridging loan, so you bridge it in, do what you need to do on it to improve it, to increase the value, then you sell it. But you need to do it all within a time period of the bridging loan itself. So if you've got a 12-month bridge, you need to make sure you can get in do the work, get it on the market and get it sold within that time frame without going over, otherwise you could pay uh, extension fees which can be costly depending on the lender you're using. Uh, but I wouldn't buy with a mortgage, 
I would bridge you instead. Uh, it's the proper way of doing it. You can people do do it with mortgage and stuff, but you can pay early repayment charges. And as I say, it's not the correct way of doing things. What do you look for in a supplier? Price, service, or range of products? So it is a commodity business in many ways. So price is really important. But for me, it's not just about price it's about service like the, some of the some of the like the best reports we've built are with um just the rep doesn't matter who they, they work for it's with the rep um and also people that have stuck with us through tough times like we do we've got a great relationship with mkm um mm -hmm. the Sharston branch the, and the manager there is, is called mark and he's looked after us at a time when we were like really like struggling because as I've talked about, materials went through the roof and things like that, and you know, we, it was really juggling financially. And he, he stuck by us, and they're great. We can ring them now, and um, and we'd, we'd get a delivery for the next day. And we've got a few like that, but I, I believe you should spread the spend a little bit. You know, it's not all about price. You need the right price, but you should spread your spend about if you're growing. Cause what you don't want is a one supplier a hundred grand on one day and you might not have the money to, to pay it mm -hmm. so sometimes it's best to spread your spend across multiple suppliers so it, it's easier to find the money two grand for that supplier three grand for that supplier and if they have to go and stop for a little bit and it happens to all trust me the big boys they have mm -hmm. to go and stop for a bit then you can pay them off and then but you've still got this account or that account mm -hmm. sometimes it's down to geography so it's like if we're in the area and we just need something quick and if it's a pound more expensive, I'm not going to drive further because remember, mm -hmm. you've got the most expensive delivery driver in the world, the trade's been driving. So we'll just nip to there. Like for example, Screwfix, like they are not the cheapest, they're not. Uh, but if you want to sponsor us, that's fine. Um, and, but, but what they are is always, they generally always have the stock and easy like, users, easy to use, and, and, and they're everywhere, they're everywhere. Uh, and I do think if a lot, a lot of other builders merchants should get on board with that kind of efficiency where you can mm. like, you know, check sell, stock levels, check stock level, book it out, click and collect, it's great. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of both. I'd say price is important. You would never go with them like if someone's really expensive, but I don't bat an eyelid about paying an extra sort of 50p a meter if the service is great. I do think in an ideal world, you put all your eggs in one basket with one supplier, show them absolute loyalty and you get amazing service, but you can't do that. It's too dangerous as a yeah. strategy because you know they might decide they don't want to work with you one day. Yeah. You might have to go and stop and you've got nowhere else. So I try and stay loyal and speak to your suppliers. I've learned this the hard way. If you do have to go and stop, ring them and say, look, I'm really sorry, I'm waiting for a payment. Um, we'll be, you know, it'll be by this date or can we just pay you? Uh, X amount per week till then and we've had to do it the big boys have had to do it because they tell me I big companies that we all know household names go and stop <laughs> so I, I won't I don't, doesn't worry me really it just but just have good open dialogue with all your suppliers how did forming a partnership work and how does the level of trust work well, uh, if you're talking how we did it legally, we did it eventually. We agreed the head to terms with ourselves, like what the basic framing of the deal would look like. And then we got solicitors involved uh, and mm -hmm. accountants and they sort of did the back end. But we, basically we did it on a handshake. Like when you, when you do a deal, um, a deal can break down so fast as well. As yeah. fast as you can set it up, it can mm. break down. Can so we, I think people drag it out. Key as well. yeah. And ours did go a little bit slower than yeah. what we anticipated because we got the wrong solicitor at the time. Yeah. We got recommended to use to mm. set it up and they just weren't the quickest, but mm. we kept speaking it was so, and we were still we, working together, yeah. so it was okay. We, we knew, and at the end of the day, something's worth what someone is prepared to sell it for and what someone's prepared to pay for it. Like I knew what I valued the company at. But if you looked on paper, it might not have been worth that much. I, it, there's loads of different ways of valuing companies. But really, I know what lifestyle it gave me. I knew that it was going to basically give me a lifestyle for the rest of my life. So I had to put a value on that. But then, then it was over to Alex to say, right, well, okay, what's it actually worth to me? And what, what kind of, how will it benefit my life? So it took a while, but we just knew, like, we did whatever we agreed there wasn't was kind of irrelevant because we it was more about what we yeah, were going we to turn it into yeah. yeah we, we want to build this construction group where we construction is just one part of it property is one part of it we've now added preferred joinery mm -hmm. um you know and that's another part of it a manufacturing side and then we'll, we've built like the grabs and aggregate side mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to acquire other businesses aren't yeah, so we we'll just we'll, we'll add into the group of companies that we mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. everything that complements each other so we'll buy companies that we use already or mm. we do things that will save us money in the long term. So we become our own supplier to that 
of the industry or that side of the business mm -hmm. uh, and it's bundled it all together in one big holding company um, and control every aspect of it all that's but the key in terms of the trust side I mean I don't even question it like we've said this laughed about it we could probably have each other off loads of times but mm -hmm. it just never do it I, I decided early on that if I was going to do this with Alex I, I'd have to trust him 100% and, mm -hmm. and, and like it, it just be like if I had any trust issues with Alex, I just wouldn't do it because it'd drive me insane because yeah. that is one of my I worst things. No, because that's one of my, like, I, things like that. If I think people want to, we did, probably should have said about the pet hate for, one of my things is I have to trust people. Like, and if I think people are having us off or yeah. just, you know, hard, it? I, I can't, it yeah. keeps me awake at night and I have to confront yeah, it. You pick up that fast though, don't you? Like yeah. if people are around you who are like that, you can gauge yeah, them straight you know, away. Yeah, you know, and it just traits, character yeah. traits, but we're not like, you know, it's like, <laughs> It just, it, I can't only speak for myself, but I, I don't, like, I, you know, I, I just yeah. have a perfect trust because you can only, I could only break Alex's trust once and he can only break my yeah, trust exactly. once yeah. and then it's gone and it's yeah. there forever and it's just like, yeah. like, I, I, you know, I've said this, things, I, I, I did this, I sold off my baby essentially to Alex and I did that knowing that I wanted to work with Alex until that, mm. if uh, we retire, mm. and you, uh, you've said that, yeah, but yeah, well, we probably won't, will we? <laughs> yeah, like maybe at the time, but but like, so trust is hard. Partnerships are really hard, and trust me, I've been in bad partnerships, and I've said that where you, you, you know, we're not contributing. Like, mm. I'm one person doing all the work, but the thing is, with Alex and I, is that we're both two different types, totally of different business. people, you know I mean? totally so different I'm people. More conservative, sit behind. So we'll mm. speak before we go into a meeting. Me yeah. and Chris, yeah. we'll talk together about stuff, yeah. come with loads of stuff, and then Chris will deliver it. That's yeah. Chris's skill set. Yeah. Whereas I can't deliver it as good as Chris. Yeah. But then he'll follow in with bits. But we've yeah. got different skill sets, and and it's because so that's how it works. But again, that's not really a trust thing. I think the trust thing just comes from character. Like yeah. we're both from like you know honest families and like we've had the similar kind of upbringing yeah like we've always talked about the man can scouse thing like it doesn't even i don't yeah. i don't that's like we laugh about it but it's like there's nothing in that for me like alex is like probably one of the honest and scouse people generally probably one of the honest loyal like yeah. people that yeah. i've met because it, they'll do anything for yeah them. and i and i and likewise um, but yeah, so yeah, I just think the trust is there, and if, if that if that was even in question, I don't think I could be in business with you. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. do it because um, it, it, you just it's everything really. Because like business is so important in our lives, I don't think I could be a business yeah, person. It's our lifestyle, trust. isn't it? So. Yeah, well, isn't it? It's a hobby. It's everything, isn't it? We do, you know, we don't. I don't really have a hobby, you know. So it's yeah, this is it. Yeah. I'm a small developer bringing on board a contractor to build things cheaper. Is this why you guys joined forces? Depends how you mean bringing them on board. If you bring them in as an equity partner, then it can make sense, yeah, because obviously their margins are not going to be in the build. So if you're doing a certain amount of development, so you're doing a million pound build, and their margin's going to be 20% of that, you know, could make, make use of the money better by giving them a share of the equity if you're only going to make 400k on GDV, for instance. So yeah, it could make sense, but if it's going to be a long-term strategy, you need to work out if they've got the same goals of you in terms of what they want out of it like me and Chris have got similar goals so we know we're in it for like 20 25 years to give to our kids and then look to start pulling money but like if they're trying to get rich quick or want to pull money yeah. early on you can't do that in property if you're trying to scale because it's all about the compound effect and if you start taking too early it'll take a long time to build but if you're just looking to do flips or a development to build out and sell then it can make sense if their margin is not included in the build to do that because you're gonna either pay it anyway when you're building out or um, you pay it when you split it at the end and you're splitting the risk as well. What I would say is um, our model is quite good in that. The reason why it makes total sense for having a development company and having a contractor is that essentially deals stack better. So if we're going out for investment um, or you know, or we want to look at a deal, we can essentially build it at cost or even below cost in some respects. Mm. Um, so. We could look at a deal and go right. It, it's going to cost hundred grand to build, whereas a typical developer hasn't got a construction company or hasn't got that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. They're looking at 120, 130 yeah. with, with a contractor's margin. So in a, in a sense, we're buying out the contractor's margin. Um, so it, it's but it, but it is an expensive like a lot of like developers have like their own power team, don't they? Of like builders and stuff like that. But really. Um, 
I don't necessarily think that's the best way because you're still carrying that yeah, level it just, of It just like, depends on what property you're doing. If you're doing development, then it makes sense mm, to an extent because mm. you split the risk in half as mm. well. If both these are down as director, both these have got PGEs, you know, you've split that risk there if you are looking to, your exit is to sell mm. the development. Um, but if you're looking to keep long term, depends who it is. What I'll say is if we've not addressed anything in these questions here or these answers, bang it in the comments. And, uh, yeah. and while you're there, subscribe and like this video. It's because it's free. Exactly, it's free. People don't think that. No. Subscribing is free. Yeah. And it means that we can be encouraged to make more stuff like this. Because Alex and I genuinely want to bring like as much value to the table because we believe that in return, we'll make contacts with people that will enhance our business, meet investors maybe, because mm. um, people will get to know what we're like. So, please like and subscribe the video and we will keep banging out content. I reckon we'll put out more content, more transparency than most people on YouTube. Uh, and I think that if anyone's wanting to get into a similar business to that we're in, be it construction, be it um, property, be it business generally, then we're gonna be a great sort of source of knowledge. Next question. How do you finance your properties? Uh, all through bridging loans really. So we, we get a senior lender in place which will fund up to like 70, 75% of the purchase. We'll put in the other 25 or we'll raise investment off an investor who will lend. We will then sign PGEs, other forms of security, and pay them a fixed interest, whether it's monthly or per annum. And we'll use that money to assist or we will bridge in same way, put our own money into buy and then on the building side, because it will cost us like 100, 120 grand to build out each HMO for instance. We will then lend off an investor, the same again, pay them a fixed return, use their money to build them out, uh, refinance, pay them back. Uh, so that's sort of our strategy, and then we'll refinance again once the work's done into a long-term lender, which will be like a five-year fixed uh, term, um, <clears throat> and then we'll just pay that off with the rent that comes in. I was right. listening, but I was also writing a text, but did you say that as well, we divert profits from our operational businesses? Yeah. Um, so that's another good reason about owning multiple businesses. So profit from uh, construction goes into property, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The profit eventually from all the other businesses that we're adding on will mm -hmm. eventually, or a proportion of the profit will be diverted into property because it's a great, asset class that we yeah. believe in you know me, me, most of the stuff we've done so far is all our own money isn't mm. it that's been yeah. our bottleneck really is that we could we could probably buy a house a week yeah. a house a day or we could buy land and lot but we've got a bottleneck we have to recycle we have got some investors we're quite fussy about who we work with investors wise yeah, take on anyone really because we want people that believe in us and believe in how we do it and do it the right way we don't cut corners so um we've got an amount of like what we call day one capital to yeah. deploy um that we can use and, and you know and that's growing and it grows with deals and also you leave money in deals so that it depletes with deals so yeah. that's kind of stunt in our growth albeit like God, we've got uh, probably getting on for 30 like um, properties now mm. and land deals and stuff like that. So we built a nice portfolio, but we think we could have done a lot more. We will. Yeah. It'll come and we'll probably get to meet more investors that will believe us and want to join our journey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll talk about that a, a bit more in, a, in another video. Next question. What are your plans for the future? Oof. Generally or what? I mean... I'm hoping to not go as bald as I am now and have to deal with that, to be honest. Uh, but in terms of business... Construction side, probably try and keep it where it is because it's at a good level. Level it? now, yeah, and like keep it, get it efficient. Just yeah. trim down a few more things that we you know we're getting better mm. on, pay a few more things off mm. in terms of finance that we've got mm. on certain assets. Mm. So then the, the margin that you're making on them is even higher. higher. Um, mm. Get but, the grab side going a bit more, isn't it? Yeah, the aggregate side. We'll think we'll probably, um, hopefully acquire our own site, site which, you know. Uh, It'll be a campus type hub for everything in yeah. terms of every trade. Mm. Um, which we know, we've had a couple of near misses on that and it's not quite We just had one recently, out. which was a good one, but yeah. you know, still. Yeah, so it, again, we're keeping our eye out for that. Um, but really sort of building the management team in place, which we've got really, we've got like KTM, Kieran there, who's like, basically does everything that I talk about trust. I've, like, I've got, I've, like, I, great, I've got everything. Like he has access to my banks, everything yeah. because, and, and I can go away and he, he will make sure that everything's Kieran running is right. Every he, is he, is, man, he? he is, and that's it. So it's basically keeping him um, engaged and building people around him. We've got the estimator, we've got, you know, the architectural proposition so from the construction side, 
that's kind of on the right track. We put systems in, but we worked really hard um, to build that. Property wise, property wise, keep going, mm. uh, keep doing HMOs. Mm. Mm. Let's try and tap into a couple more land deals that we've started mm. doing. Mm. Uh, to touch on the commercial side because that's what we're building out: the commercial units on the land. Mm. Um, but still do them student HMOs, keep mm. going with them. Because mm. we know them inside out and we're good at them. Yeah. Maybe we'll move into different cities, um, maybe we'll work with different people. Um, and also then, as broadly, just keep acquiring businesses. Yeah. Like we've, you know, like we've got the joinery company, which is great. We want to build that up and get that like more efficient. That can, we could quadruple the turnover on that. Mm. Um, you know, you know, like we're really interested to buy supplier, yeah, we're like a, a merchant, that. something yeah. like that, trying to get into that. M more so, like I'm, you know, probably getting to a point now where I'm thinking I don't really want to. Um, if you want to get a plumbing, uh, a plumbing and heating company that's got good contracts in place. Yeah, because we've got every heat, but we really we built that from scratch. Oh God, my kids are <laughs> kicking off. Um, not build that from scratch and just literally bolt like companies onto our existing companies. But we're just business people. We're entrepreneurs in the, the day, and if there's a deal to be had, we'll do it. The mm. mechanic side, I'm loving that, yeah. and it's like it's great seeing it um, grow. And I think, but people, are everything. If you don't bring the right people in, then oh, yeah. the then about. it doesn't work. So we're just we're just open. Deals find deals. Simple. I have a small startup construction company and have a subcontractor working for me. How do you set how long the work will take? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one, isn't it? So all down to when you do your pricing. So we've spoken about this a few times. Mm. That's how we've managed to make every trade itself more compact than what we do in numbers. So from the pricing stage is when you allow time to a certain aspect of that job. So you have allowed four days for putting stud work in and you've got to join a work into your own subcontract. Then you've got, you'd have to say to them, be honest, look, I've got four days in for this. We need to do it within the four days. Or you try and set another parameter for them to stick with that. Or monitor it, say nothing, and then assess it at the end, say we only had four days into that. But it depends on it. We've it's hard as well because what you've got is, <clears throat> so an estimator will price it, a QS or, or even a builder, and you'll go, well, that should take four days, for example. Mm. Um, but join A, we'll do it in four days, yeah. but join a B, who's slower, we'll do it in five days, uh, or join a C, D and E, who's got level, different levels of experience, will take longer or shorter, so it's really hard. So pricing to a point, so talking about the pricing part of it, there is a degree of sort of learning from your experience mm -hmm. going that that took that long, so I'd allow that. Yeah, you need to a building contingency. Data. Yeah. yeah, but really what we do now, we've got an estimator and when we produce our sort of estimates and that, the back end side, which is like bill of quantities and whole schedules, we'll know that we've got uh, 10 days in for, to do something, for example. So we'd say to our guys, be honest and say, you've got 10 days to do this, or you've got two weeks or whatever. Or you might be clever and go, you've got nine days, but if you do it, mm -hmm. or, you know, or you've got 10 days, but if you do it in nine days, you get a bonus or mm -hmm. whatever. Or job and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a price there and you're using subcontractors, it's just the price. So if they if you've got five grand in and they come in at five grand, you're happy. Yeah. yeah? Or if they come in at four and a half, happy days. You know, mm -hmm. so it's hard. The, and, 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 and you've got to learn your tradesmen yourself, you know, because you might be pricing for your own stuff. Um, but you just got to keep making them notes as the job mm. progresses and keep making, or add all the data up and as each job goes on, you just get better and better yeah. and better. That's machine learning. Doing. We've machine learned. Like, that's what Alex is big on, his data is like learning how long things are taking. We probably mm. don't do it enough now, but, um, but our, it's got so much better since we put these systems in place. Mm. Like we know that if we're pricing a high-end um, kitchen installation, we've got one or two um, of our guys that are brilliant at that, but they take longer, so we allow yeah, more exactly. time. Yeah. Um, or if it's a first fix job, we know we, you know, we could probably take a bit less time on it. Mm. Um, but it is hard. But in an ideal world, everything would be done on price, but you can't. If you're building the model that we've built, which is basically guys on day rate, you need um, reliability, so you need it, them people. Yeah, so we do that because we want to offer that level of service and have that reliability. You don't want the stress of trying to find someone all the time. Then, you know, you are, it, it is, things do take a bit longer, but you've got to work that into your model. Mm. Um, and, and allow contingency is hard, one of the hardest bits. Again, pricing, huge subject, standalone video at some point. <laughs> Let us know if you want that video. We'll do it honestly. Please let us know in the comments. Is, yeah, because and, and and if we haven't answered any of these questions in in the in this video here, bang it in the comments or go on our Instagram pages. So every trade, every underscore trade or emperor underscore property and Alex and I yeah, yeah both got access to both. Either if it's more Alex, 
it'll answer if it's more me or we'll both come in. And we mm. want to do it, we want to help people. Next question. I'm in construction project management, so feel I'm capable of project managing a full renovation. I have a small team that can do most of the work now. I also have done project for my family and friends. Would you recommend that the first property should be done through solely all on your own capital? If it is, financing, which one is the best to do? Mm, it's about 12 questions in yeah, that, So uh, if you're already doing it anyway, and there's your, your line of work, then you've got the skill set to be able to pull it off. <clears throat> I would use, if you've got your own capital, use your own capital because if things do go wrong, you've got no one to answer to. Uh, if you haven't got your own capital, then you've got no choice but to find investment. But I think your USP is the fact that you do it as a day job. So speaking to any investor or family friend who would invest in you, you know, it's easy to say I do them things, what you've just said, um, but I want to do it for myself sort of thing and do you want a piece of the pie? Uh, that's how I would probably go about doing it. But other than that, um, I don't know, what do you reckon there? It's like... I um, it depends. It depends what you want, how you want to work. Some people can't do the stuff themselves and things like that, can they? So it's like I know. So if you have got a good team that do want to do it, then yeah. And if you have got the money there to do it yourself, then depends if you want scale. Like you know, yeah. you, you could. Eat. I know loads of really wealthy people that have just over the years have just done them themselves, done mm -hmm. a, flipped a few, um, you know, held on to a few, and and, and you know, and just. I put it alongside what they do, but we we, we want to build a multi revenue stream business, so we want to delegate as much of everything as possible and put managers managing managers, if yeah. you know what I mean, and put sort of like filtrate ourselves from you know. I don't, yeah. I mean, Alex is still we're busy than ever now, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we are, but I'm busy in better areas. Like, yeah. Alex, you're still probably because the property side got a small team, and, and obviously, because Alex is a bit of a micromanager, you are because yeah. you've got high standards, you're still getting calls from site yeah. a lot. Whereas, I've got project managers, and if, it, if the project manager can't answer it, it goes to Kieran. If Kieran can't answer it, it will probably come to me, and it's like, so I've insulated myself from that a little bit. I, don't get me wrong, I still sometimes get on the ground and I am. A, I can't really, like, I have to shut my office door because if I hear something that I don't, you know, I can't switch off and the kids are going mentally. Um, so, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, but I would just say, depends what you want. Build a team. Yeah. You know, I think it's, you know we need a team. Replace yourself with people that are better than you. But if it's your first one, you need to be involved. Get the going, yeah. You do yeah. learn it. You need to learn. I know pretty much everything about construction and you know, from, from being in and around it, you know. So no one can have me over, generally speaking. Yeah. Last question. Mm. How do you work out what the margin you should charge customers or what is appropriate? Mm. I know where you're going with this one, I think. Yeah, it's good. Ah, that's a good question. Generally, so don't even finish it. We used to have a standard margin anyway, don't we? There is a standard margin Depending across the board. Depending on the size of the job as well. Yeah, but... If it's a small works job. I think with this, and again, we keep saying it, it's a standalone video, and I've touched on this in the episodes, margin is one thing, right? The industry generally has a 20, 15, 20%, 30%, whatever margin, right? But... It, that's not the key bit here. This, the, the this is something that Alex and I have really worked on and like we, it, Alex has done a lot of work on, it's continual work, is actually what the true cost is mm. to deliver a project. What is the true cost? You need of to running. know the ins and outs of your own company down to the penny, what it costs you per day to have them men on the ground and then you can backtrack that then and reverse engineer mm. what it costs you in terms of what you need to charge mm. to that customer. Um, Margin is cream, right? Margin's the yeah. bit that sits there. So that's great, amazing. That's what gives you an amazing lifestyle. That's what means you can invest back in your company, that bit there. But it's this bit is the most important, yeah? yeah? The, people, so if we've got a tradesman on £150 a day and we're pricing a job, obviously we're not just going to go £150 plus, plus margin. margin. It's not. It's £150 plus overhead. Then plus margin. Plus margin, right? And there is a formula on that. And again, like people are asking me, and I like to do mentoring and things like that. And maybe that's something we've we could, talked we about. We probably sit down with people and work it out. And, and do some kind of it because we have hammered it down to yeah. everything. But loosely speaking, essentially, you need to know what your company costs to run mm -hmm. and then net that down per, I think, per hour, yeah, yeah. at working hour. Yeah, that's and what we've done, yeah. And literally add contingency, add wastage, add everything in. And then 
work out a true cost to run your business and be honest with yourself. Yeah, don't blag, because that's what I used to do. I used to go best case scenario and everything. It's you not worth it. You need to remember within over it, though, mm. that includes your wage yep. as well. Your wage isn't in the profit. Your wage is not profit. Because yeah. what's the point of having a business? You might as well get a job, right? So that makes sense. If you, any job you do, mm. even if you break even, mm. you've still been able to pay yourself. Mm. And remember, you only pay tax on profits, mm -hmm. right? So that's the bit you pay tax on. So probably, roughly speaking, 20 odd percent at least is going to the tax man. So that what's left is the cream. So if you deliver your business, you, you know, everything you deliver at job, that, that bit there is the most important bit for me yeah. is cost and yeah. overhead, yeah? Get that right, but yeah. But in terms of percentage though, we charge the same amount more mm. or less, but if it's a small works job, mm. you're in and out within a day or two. It's higher, isn't it? Yeah, it's higher margin because less people want to do it. You, you're not, you know, you've got less contingency because it's not, mm. it's not as big. Mm. You can't break a job, you've got a bit more contingency mm. to play with. Mm. Things do go wrong. But generally speaking, the construction industry, I think the margins are too low. And again, yeah. that's something I feel very strongly about um, because there's a lot of competition out there. It's not a licensed industry. Anyone can call themselves a builder. Um, it's high risk as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the barrier to entry is really low. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone could do it. So they're probably not making nothing new. I, I've got friends that work in IT and stuff like that is like 400 percent it's mm -hmm. ridiculous but you know it's specialism so what we've done is added some specialist trades and like you know we've got an m&e business because not everyone can do m&e because it's regulated the grabs know. you know so the magic man thing so that's mm -hmm. a very highly skilled skill set uh, the, the grabs like i was saying there you need a 60 70 grand grab truck plus your operator's license everything that goes with it so yeah, I mean, that's why I love our businesses because we've got multi disciplines, we've got multi skill sets. We don't rely on joinery, plastering, um, property. We've got multiple different things contributing to the pot. And anything that's left over, we divert into a long term, steady class at, uh, asset class, which is property. Yeah. But this is going to be one long video. Again, if you've got any other questions, bang them in the comments, yeah? Both Alex and I read the comments. We're small enough to do that at the moment. Please be nice, because our kids, well, my kids, your kids are baby, but my kids read the comments. <laughs> but um, I don't mind if it's like us off behind our back, it's fine. Um, get us on Instagram and let us know if you want any standalone videos. I'm determined to make these midweek videos more standalone, not necessarily just what's happened in the week. And I hope you found value uh, in what we've said and hope we've not sort of banged on for too long um, come back on Sunday for a normal action packed weekly episode of every trade behind the build so click here for Sunday's video click here and click here you always get it wrong I know yeah not, he, he edited some wrong <laughs> videos you should have seen before <laughs> and click here to subscribe to the channel don't shake your head Hollywood you put the wrong videos in the wrong corner see you on Sunday